Good morning and welcome to NYC TV Live. I'm Trinity Chavez and today is Tuesday, January 23rd and the New York Stock Exchange is packing a punch or a kick or even a body slam this morning as TKO Group Holdings gets set to ring the opening bell in just about a half an hour. Our team here has been at it all night, putting up TKO's branding all over this iconic building, from the cubes behind me above the trading floor to the video screens on the NYSE building on the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in Lower Manhattan. But today, we start today's broadcast with some breaking news. Dwayne The Rock Johnson has just been named to TKO's board of directors. Johnson also receiving full ownership of his trademark for The Rock. Johnson, whose grandfather and father also wrestled in the WWE, said in a news release, quote, I'm very humbled to have a seat at the table that has been decades of history and family legacy for me, a table that my family helped to build. Vince McMahon, TKO's executive chairman of the board, adding, quote, very few people on the planet understand the convergence of sports, entertainment, media, and business like The Rock. We are so proud to have him join TKO board to help take our company to new heights. Johnson's portfolio outside the ring is arguably as impressive as his performance in it, which includes his involvement with Seven Bucks Productions, Project Rock, and recently combined Spring Football League, the UFL. Now, some of you may recall back in September, TKO made a lot of noise here at the New York Stock Exchange when Endeavor, parent company of the UFC, completed a majority stake purchase of WWE. Executives rang the bell here at the exchange on September 12th. Now, as a part of the merger, 51% of TKO is held by Endeavor, with the remaining 49% being held by WWE. Ari Emanuel, the CEO for Endeavor, assumed the same role with a new combined company, while WWE Chief Vince McMahon is the executive chairman. But there are so many more prominent names in leadership, including Triple H, Dana White. They are just some of them that are among them all, and they were right here with us not too long ago. But now they are back working to make the TKO a premium sports and entertainment company. They were all here and playing a hand, taking part in it with the celebration just a few months ago. Let's take a look back at that moment.
Now, both the WWE and the UFC are continuing to make headlines as each brand approaches a marquee event in the early spring. Let's start with the WWE, where the first uh, pay pay-per-view fights events actually in 2024 are right around the corner. The Royal Rumble headlined by men and women battle royales that the WWE has held in late January every year since 1988 takes place this coming Sunday. And on February 24th, the WWE returns to Australia for the first time since 2018 with Elimination Chamber. Now, just over a month later, WWE's biggest event, WrestleMania, kicks off its 40th installment on April 6th. Now, the event has been held over two nights since 2020 when the company taped the broadcasted uh, event over two nights at the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, when it comes to viewership, the WWE has consistently maintained seven figures amongst its two most popular weekly shows. SmackDown, airing Friday nights on Fox, has drawn more than two million viewers during each broadcast this year. Meanwhile, Raw, which airs Monday nights on USA Network, has reeled in more than 1.4 million viewers each week in 2024. And in more breaking news today, Netflix and the WWE reaching a deal to begin streaming Monday Night Raw exclusively on the platform starting in January 2025. The exclusive stream will be available in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and Latin America. We will dive deeper into this development later on in today's broadcast, but we're going to shift gears a little bit. Now, from the ring to the octagon, the UFC has been generating plenty of buzz as it approaches UFC 300 in April. But when it comes to cash cows in the sport, one name stands out, Conor McGregor. McGregor topped Forbes' list of highest paid athletes in 2021 at a whopping $180 million. $158 million of that came from endorsements, and even though McGregor didn't fight in 2022, he still ranked 35th on the list. Now we bring that up because McGregor, uh, well there's speculation that the fighter could be making a return this year. This past New Year's Eve, McGregor announced that he would be returning to the coming, well actually returning this coming June in Las Vegas. However, UFC President Dana White later said that while McGregor is expected to fight this year, his return date and weight class have yet to be confirmed. Now, joining me to talk more about this is Asla Pellet, sports deals reporter at Sportico. Good morning, Asla. It's great to have you here. Good morning. What a day to be here, I actually. mean, especially with the breaking news <laughs> as we were coming on the air, right? Yeah. Um, so, actually, let's talk about the big news. I mean, it's obviously impacting markets and everything. What are we seeing right now? What do you think we can expect from this deal? Um, first of all, I think when uh, the two brands got together and TKO was formed, um, the main idea behind it was like to find crossovers between the two brands. Um, I think it's very interesting because they're two different, two totally different sports properties. Yeah. One is a show, the other one is a real sport and it's very difficult sport. So I think the brands together coming in to, as a company, um, that's the main goal. There has been crossovers in the past, as you know, with you know big names. Yeah. And I think today's news of Dwayne coming to the picture as a board member, I think that's the most important news. He's such an important figure in media. He really knows how to use his star power to everywhere he goes. So yes. like him being part of a third generation you know, fighter, I think that is an incredible addition to TKO's board that already probably has plans for the company. Yeah, absolutely, and you said it best, right? He has a very, very notable name, just like TKO, WWE, UFC. So let's talk about these huge powerhouse brands. What would you say is the overall effect that it's having on the live sports entertainment landscape? Um, I think one thing we can look from a financial perspective, like this merger, Puts, brings a lot more eyeballs to the financials of the, the entities. WWE already had uh, part of Endeavor, was exposed financially. Now UFC, which has been in more of a, um, you know, a private uh, mm -hmm. company. Now we will see how their numbers are changing and yeah. we're going to get to like follow that. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think the main reason they got together is foster collaboration, bringing strengths of two brands together and see what they can create. Because as you know, um, sports is the best business uh, on television, live sports. So bringing something so um, incredibly 
entertaining yeah. and also difficult and you know as you know and men and humanly possible bring those two powers together i think that's what we're going to see and then I mean, I think sky is the limit for them to do crossovers, right? Yeah, of course. And, you know, it's not the first time we've seen this. Maybe we'll start seeing more of these crossovers, mergers um, coming coming up. But, you know, I want to talk about um, Endeavor purchasing WWD, obvious, uh, WWE, rather. So it's created a merger that has created a $21 billion powerhouse, right? I mean, but there's not really anything else that's happened in recent years that's really comparable to this sort of merger. So what would you say we can expect, um, you know, in the coming years? As Do you think this is going to become more popular? Um, you mean bringing, like, buying sports brands like this? Yes. Um, so in America, as you know, there's NFL and there's everything else. So I think a lot of companies are looking at sports entities, sports properties, and say, what can I do to compete with the big, you know, um, I think the prize, which is the NFL. And if you're not going to be able to reach NFLs and NBAs, you have to look at sports properties that you can afford to buy, but also brings, you know, constant revenues mm -hmm. um, permanently. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if there will be another big merger like this or a big entity that will be valued at this. It's a, it's a league, you know, wide. Yes. Um, I think this was a great opportunity and they didn't want to miss it. And I think the timing was right. The product was right for in. And like I said, there will be an opportunity for UFC, mostly UFC fighters to come to WWE, mm -hmm. which has happened in the past. And I think that's what the big, you know, goal and hope yeah. of the company, I would say. Let's talk about the sports sector overall, right? I mean, we recently saw the NFL's Denver Broncos get sold for $4.5 billion, and then the Washington Commanders sell for $6 billion. So how do you think sports franchises get valued? Do you think, and why do you think the, um, the numbers are rising so dramatically? I mean, these are huge price points, billions and billions of dollars we're seeing. Yeah, well, there's nothing like sports business. And I think factors that play that role why the valuations are going up is basically scarcity value. Unlike other sports leagues in the world, our leagues are closed entities. There's no promotion and relegation. So the value of your team can only go up if there is um, no, there's no reason for them to go down, first of all, um, because they will never um, be part, of, they will never be not part of a league that it's already been sold and promoted and like, you know, uh, famous, but I was going to say broadcast uh, rights values. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. going up constantly, and that adds to the value. Leagues are managed incredibly well in the United States. That means they distribute their um, revenues mm -hmm. from the broadcast, from sponsorship and ticket sales. So everyone makes it. You don't even have to win. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Washington Commanders. The last time they won anything was 1992, yeah. yet they were sold at a record price. And the man who bought it is a very smart businessman. So if it was another sports property around the world, people would be like, why would I buy a team that doesn't win anything? But it doesn't apply to U.S. sports, especially NFL. Like I said, there is NFL and there is everything else. Buying an NFL team is constant revenue. Also, it's a prestige. A lot of billionaires like to own sports teams yeah. and it makes <laughs> I mean, them special. It's part of being like a club, to. right? Yes. You know, you're a club, you know, you're an NFL owner. Yes. That puts you in a pedestal, I think, also in the yeah. eyes of other billionaires. Well, thank you so much for all of those key points. It was great to have you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Switching gears a little bit, the streaming wars have significantly impacted both the sports and entertainment world. And I recently spoke with Kevin Mayer. He is the founder and co-CEO of Candle Media on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And he's a name that you may recognize. Mayer was previously the CEO of TikTok and a former Disney executive. And here's what he had to say on the transition to Candle Media and the future of the space. It was interesting. I spent most of my career at the Walt Disney Company, 27 years. I had the privilege of launching Disney Plus around the world, so that was a great run at Disney. TikTok was also a very big company. It was a much different company. It was a tech company versus an entertainment company. But I love the notion of being an entrepreneur. It's fun to do something new and build something that's, uh, I think, built for the, for the future. Tell me about your mission with Candle Media. What is it trying to accomplish? 
Our mission is to speak to audiences in a very deep and authentic way. You tell great stories. Those stories are extensible to social media. We can engage a two-way audience in a very, very big way and keep those franchises alive over the long term. That creates a really great opportunity to have commerce associated with your brands and storytellers. And speaking of brands, Candle Media, I mean, it has already had huge success in the digital space. It owns Moonbug. It owns Hello Sunshine. What do you attribute the success to? We try to buy companies that have great product already and the burgeoning nature of a brand. So Hello Sunshine, a company built by Reese Witherspoon and her executive team that had done some great things, including The Morning Show, but they put women at the center of the story. And that's something that speaks to a female audience in a deep and emotionally connected way that you otherwise wouldn't have. And you're right about Moonbug. You know, we have the largest um, YouTube channel in Cocomel and that's the number three or four show streamed on Netflix year in and year out. So I wanna talk about your recent partnership with TikTok. And as a former CEO, what was the decision-making process behind that? TikTok is a platform that's doing social media storytelling in a way that has never been done before. We are a content to commerce company at Candle, and all of our properties, we wanna have a social media storytelling component that bridges the gap from when you launch something on streaming, you know, until you launch the next season, that can be a year, year and a half. What you really wanna have is that ongoing presence with telling that story, connecting your audiences on social media. So we wanna be connected to that. Yes. I know the team, very comfortable with it. So that was why we made a, a nice, substantial deal with that. Now let's talk about all the advancements happening in the digital space, right? AI, technology. What do you think the most exciting things happening right now in the sector are? You're taking AI and using it in the entertainment world. That's pretty unprecedented yeah. stuff. And I think as a tool, it makes a ton of sense. I don't believe that AI is ever going to replace human creativity. It's not going to tell the great new stories of our generation and the generations to come. You need human beings to do that. But as a tool, in your toolkit, it's great. In this ever-changing landscape of technology, innovation, how do you remain innovative from where you sit? How do you stay ahead of the curve? When new technology comes out, when new paradigms, when new platforms are launched, just yeah. pay attention to it. Like I'm a natural, you know, naturally curious person. So when things are happening, I want to know about what they are, then I want to experience them. In the entertainment industry, we're trying to make culture, we're trying to move culture. And to do that effectively, you need to know what people are paying attention to, what matters to people. You just have to be curious and have to take it all in and, and care about things. You could tell as I'm speaking with you how passionate you are about this topic. What would be your one piece of advice for businesses or entrepreneurs who are embarking on this uh, digital media journey? How can they be successful? Pay attention to your customer, learn about them, know what they want and what they need, and how that intersects with your product and your service offering and your pricing strategy and your marketing strategy. Customer at the center, blinders on to everything else. I think you're in good. Now, while the UFC and WWE both have programming on cable, UFC broadcasts some of its smaller fights on ESPN. Both are looking to deliver a knockout punch in the streaming wars. Beginning in January 2019, ESPN Plus became the home of live and on-demand UFC matchups, including UFC Fight Night and UFC pay-per-view events. Meanwhile, if you're looking to watch the upcoming WWE Royal Rumble, you'll need to purchase Peacock to do so. The streaming platform became the exclusive home of the WWE Network in the U.S. in 2021. Now, on top of that, Peacock has rolled out more than 17,000 hours of new, original, and library WWE programming. But Peacock is making other moves in sports and the world, too. Earlier this month, the platform exclusively broadcasted an NFL playoff matchup between Miami Dolphins and the Kansas City Chiefs, and saying that it was successful would be putting it mildly. According to Nielsen, 23 million... 23 million people tuned into the game, making it the most streamed live event in the U.S., actually in U.S. history for that matter. But Peacock, which has also exclusively streamed Sunday morning and afternoon MLB games each of the past two years, is competing with several other industry giants when it comes to broadcasting live sports. Amazon, for example, has been on the NFL train for years. The platform first acquired non-exclusive streaming rights to games back in 2017, but Amazon made its big move in 2021. That's when the NFL announced an 11-year media rights agreement collectively worth more than $100 billion. And as a part of that deal, Amazon Prime Video gained the exclusive rights to Thursday Night Football, reportedly paying just over a billion dollars per year. Amazon's first exclusive NFL broadcast came in 2022. That doesn't include the $100 million Amazon paid to air the first ever Black Friday game between the Miami Dolphins and New York Jets in November. And of course, who could forget when Marshawn Lynch rang the opening bell here at the New York Stock Exchange right there just last month to promote his In Yo City segments that aired during Prime Video's Thursday night football coverage. 
Now, Prime Video also broadcasted 20 New York Yankee games during the 2023 MLB season to those in the Yankees media market. Speaking of baseball, actually, Apple TV Plus has been exclusively broadcasting Friday night baseball games since the start of the 2022 season. And we can't forget to mention the company's 10-year, $2.5 billion deal to acquire the rights to Major League Soccer games in the U.S. Elsewhere, football and soccer fans can also watch live sports on Paramount+. Plus. Netflix is set to broadcast the, quote, Netflix Slam in March that will pit tennis stars Rafael Nadal and Carlos Alcaz against one another. Now, YouTube landed NFL Sunday tickets last December, allowing viewers to watch out out-of-town games, and we can't forget boxing either. DAZN has been airing live fights since 2018. ESPN, a subsidiary of Disney, ticker symbol DIS, here at the New York Stock Exchange, of course, also has a piece of that pie. And ESPN Plus doesn't only broadcast uh, combat sports, though. It also allows viewers to stream live college sporting events. Now, joining me now to talk more about this uh, is media reporter for Axios, Tim Basinger. Tim, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, as you know, a news uh, just came out this morning that Raw will be streamed exclusively on Netflix in 2025. How major is this news? I mean, this is, for one, it's, it's another example of Netflix saying they're not going to do something as as they said with um, adding advertising and then going ahead and doing it. Yeah, it's obviously it's their biggest push into live sports, live events. Um, it's it's a huge bet on the WWE's younger audience who probably is watching more streaming versus you know broadcasting cable television these days. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a huge. It's a huge move for Netflix. It's a bit of a gamble for WWE because Netflix has never, you know, really done anything close to this before. Now, before we really dive into the sports streaming landscape, you recently published a story on TKO, parent company, you know, to Endeavor, and really talking about, you know, Endeavor's future. What would you say is the potential to take over private equity firms like Silver Lake? What does that look like? Yeah, well, Silver Lake has been, you know, Endeavor's you know, one of their biggest backers, one of their biggest shareholders for a very long time. Um, they own, you know, almost three quarters of, of they own about 71% of the shares in Endeavor Group. And so when, you know, Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel last year, you know, put out that they were going to evaluate strategic alternatives for the company, you know, Silver Lake within hours, you know, kind of put out their own release and said, look, we're going to actually consider taking the company private because we don't want to give up our shares. I mean, Silver Lake, you know, they've really been big believers in Endeavor for a very long time, and they don't really want to, you know, see the company change hands from them. Now, Tim, both the WWE and the UFC broadcast live events on cable, but they also broadcast major events on pay-per-view and streaming platforms. How are the brands balancing both methods? Mm -hmm. Well, streaming has allowed more access into a lot of these pay-per-view events. I mean, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to watch WrestleMania, for example, you had to go through, you know, your television provider or somehow. And with streaming, while it's while pay-per-views are still as expensive, if not more, than they were to buy like a WrestleMania, for example, um, the ability to buy it through Peacock or through ESPN Plus has added access for, for a lot of, um, especially younger viewers. Now, the WWE streams live events on Peacock while the UFC utilizes ESPN Plus for its main events. How is the rise of streaming affecting the broadcast strategies here? Yeah, I think, you know, as with the Netflix deal this morning, I think you're seeing, you know, the, I would say the last year or two, there's been a massive acceleration in um, live sports moving to streaming. I mean, everything you laid out before I came on, you know, you have these big streaming deals now with the NFL putting Amazon on Thursday Night Football. You know, MLS is a huge deal with Apple. You, you know, Sunday Ticket going to YouTube, NFL putting an exclusive game on Peacock. Um, so you're seeing a lot of this move from linear television, broadcast television, to streaming. And I think the big loser in a lot of this is going to be cable television. I think you'll see games that were on cable either go to streaming or to broadcast. You're seeing that on the local television rights for, for some of these 
um, professional sports teams moving games from you know the regional cable sports networks to local broadcast stations. So I think cable is going to be the one that might get a bit hollowed out here while sports move to both streaming and over-the-air broadcast. Thank you so much, Tim, for all of that insight. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me. Switching gears a little bit, combat sports have soared in popularity over the past several years and brands are looking to capture the overseas audience. Our own Judy Shaw recently spoke with one championship co-founder and group president, Han Feitan, about his promotions, plans to expand to the Middle East. Let's take a listen. The thing about our sport is that it is widely you know, practiced and loved by many people all over the world. Uh, it's not like some sports, for instance, American football, that is hugely popular in the U.S., but has very limited popularity, you know, outside the U.S. So martial arts, you know, as a sport, first of all, is it's loved everywhere. So theoretically, you know, we can really kind of look at any kind of big part of the world, you know, as a potential expansion market. Now, the Middle East is very interesting. It is a big uh, region. Uh, you know, GCC alone accounts for 60 million uh, people, and there's big countries like Egypt, you know, that have over 100 uh, million people. So it's a big region. Uh, generally young population, very digitally savvy. Um, and, you know, people forget the Middle East actually has a long history of martial arts as well. Uh, you know, countries like Jordan, countries like Egypt, you know, have produced, uh, uh, you know, world championship caliber martial artists in judo and taekwondo. These are people that have medaled, you know, in the Olympics or world championships. So that, you know, tells you that this is a ripe uh, area for expansion. Um, you know, our Middle East expansion really, you know, started in Qatar a few years ago with an investment by the Qatar Investment Authority. Um, you fast forward a couple of years, uh, we're partners today with BN Sports, which is also Qatar owned. Um, you know, our, our, our um, MENA region broadcast rights uh, are with BN Sports. Uh, we have a partnership with Qatar Media City, one of the leading media development authorities of the region, to basically bring, you know, our content uh, to Qatar and eventually expand, you know, into the Middle East. So we have started uh, with uh, general entertainment. So we have our own version of The Apprentice, uh, season two of which was actually produced partly uh, in Qatar. Um, and we're now uh, actually going to start bringing live events uh, to Doha uh, as well. So yeah. you would say that you're seeing a demand for combat sports in the Middle East? For sure. Yeah, there's definitely demand for combat sport. Um, like I said, you know, the Middle East has produced, you know, many athletes uh, uh, in, in various uh, a variety of martial arts, you know, Taekwondo, Judo. Uh, there's a huge demand. You know, the sport tends to lean relatively young and it tends to be very easily enjoyed by mobile savvy uh, uh, people. Because think about it, right? It's close quarters. It's very easy to understand. It's very consumable. It's bite sized. It's snackable. You don't have to wait. No, like in a soccer game, you have to wait uh, 90 minutes for a conclusion. Uh, in, a, in a martial arts event, there's 10 to 12 bouts, uh, sorry, 10 to 12 fights, right? So you have 12 conclusions, right, in a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So it's very, uh, I guess it's very suitable for young, uh, mobile savvy uh, consumers. So do you think you'll take the company public at some point and is a U.S. listing on the table? Public listing has always been part of the plan. Uh, to be honest, we haven't focused that much on it because, you know, our last round was raised not too long ago, uh, end of 2021. So really the focus from then to now has been putting that capital to good use. So it's really heads down running the business. But yeah, I think a listing has always been part of the plan. Uh, and the U.S. would be, I think, a natural destination, if you ask me. Once again, I think we're open-minded, right? Uh, let me not answer that question prematurely, but I think the U.S. would be a high potential destination. Oh my gosh. Okay, now we are on the trading floor. I am joined with Jay Woods. He is the head of Freedom Capital Markets. I mean, what, a, what an exciting day. I mean, we were over here like getting pushed around because I'm, the crowd is so big down here today. Yeah, The Rock just pretty much pushes out of the way. That doesn't happen every day. You're lucky you didn't get a body slam, though. I, I, I would have been lucky. I, that would have been lucky. I would, I, story to tell for the ages. I like those things. But no, I am alive and it's good. But we have an exciting day. Uh, TKO, big news. Uh, unbelievable. Not just the fact that the ringing bell, but The Rock is here. He is going to be named to the board of directors uh, of this organization. And the stock is looking 91.96, close to 77.41. So I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, projected, what, about 25%? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're wearing green for a reason. Green is good here at the New York Stock Exchange. And we like we like the color green here, for sure. We do, we do. So, uh, so I mean, let's talk about more of this news. Obviously, it was breaking this morning. It's moving markets. We're seeing that. I mean, what do you think we should anticipate for the rest of the day? Well, for the rest of the day, first, the story itself. The, the fact that Netflix and TKO partner. Netflix has been looking to get into streaming for a long time, and they found the right partner. They're going to get a generation of eyeballs that they didn't have on their network. I think this partnership, as you can tell by the stock price, is going to be great for both companies. Uh, for the market, we're at all-time highs. Uh, what's better than all-time highs? That's as bullish as you can get. Uh, the IPO market is starting to pick up a little bit, we're hearing, and uh, uh, it's very positive for what the overall market's doing. It looks like we're going to open at another all-time high. Not a bad thing. So what do you think investors are specifically looking out for when it comes to brands like TKO? Oh, well, it, it, first of all, investors are looking for something they can relate to. And, and it, The Rock and, and this brand is as relatable to the audiences, not just young audiences, but audiences for old people like myself. We can, we've can we known The Rock for years. He, he's iconic. He's the first influencer that I can think of. Uh, so he, that brand itself is fantastic. And they're looking for family entertainment. Uh, you know, people like to go to sports. Now that we're past COVID, we have a lot of great companies here at the end. NYSE like Bolero, Pinstripes. These are family fun sporting events that people can go to and now they can invest in. So I think what we're seeing is the market is really accepting to these stories and these stories are accepting to the market. So it's exciting to watch. No, absolutely. So when it comes to entertainment, live events, sports, I mean, why does that excite investors so much? I mean, we, we're really seeing an uptick in it, especially in recent months. Well, it, it goes back to buy what you know, buy what you use, buy what you believe in. And then think about the network. It's not just a U.S. story. It's a global story. Uh, the way they continue to expand and their streaming network is reaching eyeballs it hasn't reached. They have over a billion people that watch UFC and WWE on a regular basis. It's just going to grow larger once it can stream and then you partner with someone that didn't have live sports. The marriage is unbelievable. Well, we're going to listen into the opening bell right now. Thank you so much for joining me. down here is just invigorating. Let's just get a shot at this crowd. Everybody is just hugely excited right in front of CNBC set. But, you know, the New York Stock Exchange has a storied history when it comes to covering the sports and entertainment world. Back in September, we had the pleasure to help kick off the 2023 college football season at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. So let's take a look at that moment. <laughs> Actually, we're going to toss it to my colleague, Josh King. He has the last word. Thank you all for watching. Thanks, Trinity. You know, thanks, Trinity. You know, there isn't a set of three ropes separating the New York Stock Exchange bell and the assembled audience that just watched our opening bell ring. But there might have been, given the professional wrestling and ultimate fighting royalty that just appeared before our NYSC TV live cameras. Some of those names you've seen before here, Ari Emanuel, CEO of TKO, the William Morris Endeavor impresario who has dominated the entertainment world over the past many years, along with Dana White, Mark Shapiro, and the legendary Vince McMahon. They were here last year, not that long ago, back in September, as TKO officially began trading on the NYSC following the combination of WWE and UFC. Now, what that moment represented, as you've heard Trinity and several people talking about today, most recently Jay Woods down on the floor just now, was the beginning of the movement of sports and live entertainment from terrestrial or linear television, the type of television that we all grew up with, with the clicker and a couple of channels and maybe some cable, to what we're seeing now in streaming. 
Another big chapter in that story came last week when Peacock and the NFL, in the first ever exclusively live-streamed playoff game, achieved an audience of nearly 28 million viewers watching the wildcard matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Miami Dolphins, the fourth coldest game in NFL history. Now, this is what Mark Shapiro, president and CEO of TKO, said last year, right here at the NYC, on the combination of the WWE and UFC. He said, and I'm going to quote him here, these are highly engaged global fan bases who are young, diverse, and incredibly passionate. They're seeking sports, entertainment, music, live events, and premium experiences, all of which we specialize in. That was Mark Shapiro. And then Ari Emanuel weighed in with investors when the WWE UFC pact was announced last April. He said, quoting Ari here, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring together two leading pure play sports and entertainment companies that operate in the most attractive parts of the media ecosystem. That's what Ari said. So folks, this is all about demographics. There's a broad appeal for this kind of entertainment. And unlike Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL, these live shows are on our schedules and TV screens year round. No seasonality as long as you have access to a streamer or maybe pay per, for a pay per view. And now, into the ring, as you just saw standing with Lynn Martin and Ari and everyone else from TKO, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, 51 years old, one of the most charismatic, telegenic, successful crossover hits in wrestling, television, and movie history. He talked about the legacy of his grandfather and father up in the boardroom just now, incredibly gracious to all those who were there to see him, along with Ari. The Rock's films, Dwayne's films, from The Mummy Returns in 2001 to Jungle Cruise in 2021 to Red One, which is set to debut this year, have grossed over $3.5 billion in North America and over $10.5 billion worldwide. That's what The Rock's appeal is all about. And with his 395 million followers, I said million, 395 million followers on Instagram, including me, heck, I've even been known to sip Mr. Johnson's Terramana tequila on occasion. I am old enough to remember well with my buddies going to see Bruno San Martino and Larry Zbysko square off in a World Wrestling Federation steel cage match in the old Boston Garden. But it's a brave new world watching the entertainment streaming from TKO in my living room. All I can say is grab a beer, pop some popcorn. Are you ready to rumble? I'm Josh King, and that's the last word. Together, we built something truly beautiful in the true iconic notion of what America is all about. This is our task, this is our mission. We have a clear focus and we have the ability to be agile and innovate. It takes years of dedication to get us to this milestone. It is all because of you. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It is the only thing that ever has. To be a woman leader, it's not so easy, but it's easy if the passion and the love is coming from your heart. The New York Stock Exchange is the symbol of what America is all about. The potential of capitalism, the potential of an American dream. The only way you can move a society forward is a true expression of freedom.